A conspiracy can take many forms, some more complex than others. Look at price fixing. And what do you think our world leaders are doing when they're meeting behind closed doors? Socializing? Playing darts over a couple of beers and talking about the garden? No of course they're not. They're planning moves for the future, negotiating, saying, if you do this, I'll do that. Well gee, sounds like, you've got it a conspiracy. Even in tandem if you want get finicky about it because they are doing it all behind closed doors, our publicly elected leaders of the public have privately conspired to discuss things that concern the public out of public earshot. They've conspired to further conspire if you like. You know how it goes, let's be realistic about it. Criminals are charged with conspiracy regularly. In fact two persons with criminal records need only converse with each other to be charged with conspiracy. Yet when someone mentions the word conspiracy in regards to the government or especially the academia community there is invariably a huge media storm whipped up around them and they are publicly ridiculed. So are we then to assume that no one but criminals or terrorists ever plan things together in private in order to achieve an outcome that is mutually favorable for them? I mean in reality, isn't that what politics is actually all about? That's why parliaments have closed sessions. To plan things, to conspire so they all know what the next move will be, entire economies can either flourish or flounder from the outcome of such meetings, it's called politics, if done on a corporate level we call it insider trading and you go to jail. It's a bit obvious really but in actual fact, in the real world, conspiracies happen virtually all the time blatant double standards constantly flown in full public view while being cunningly denied can always be a fascinating topic but, when used by powerful governments who don't even bother to disguise them anymore, they can also become a little scary too. Don't get me wrong, I don't like to think the worst of anyone, but looking at it logically and realistically. What, after all, was the blatant invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq by the coalition of the willing or was that a coalition of the economically coerced? if not a conspiracy to deceive the peoples of at least three nations, if not the world. Of course, when initiating any such mass deception, the best way is to prevent any real conspiracy from being exposed is to create an unending air of ridicule around anyone making the claims supporting to it. This is because if you can make the person look stupid enough in public, whether they are or not, even by dropping snide little comments here and there at the correct moments, then other people won't want to listen to what the person is saying either, even if it's very important and concerns them greatly. You get the who but some people say, syndrome. It sort of goes like this. Some people say the theory is stupid. What, you believe it? You're kidding. But wait, you're not stupid too are you? It's a tried and true formula. No one wants to feel that they might be thought of as stupid or weird. Now do they? Politicians and media tend to use this method frequently, while the Fox Fix News Network seems to have refined it down to an art form. They do it to promote the party line but just always seem to neglect to mention who these some people actually are. Of course, due to cunning media portrayals, to make an actual conspiracy appear virtually non-existent to the public, you just have to put the word theory in the same sentence or even just publicly call it a conspiracy claim and the public subconscious will automatically associate it with the word theory and view the person making the claim as a conspiracy theorist then everyone will start thinking of the X-Files UFOs and the lunatic fringe and it will all go away. Planting this type of seed in someone's mind is the effect or eliminating free and independent thought. As was once pointed out in an enormously witty and typically humorous article by the extraordinarily prolific composer Frank Zappa. Many people, when faced with something that may require serious thought or opinion, or perhaps may require them to think outside of what is the accepted norm seem to willingly lower their socio-intellectual profile and undergo this strange kind of self-inflicted, homemade, mental nose job almost every day, in order to maintain their status as one of the guys. As he pointed out, Many modern people treat intelligence as some kind of hideous deformity and in order to cosmeticize it, they willingly lower their perceived IQ level in order to be able to converse about insignificant drivel with their peers. Let's face it, it's no good to appear too intelligent because no one wants to hang around with someone who is smarter or possibly more informed than they are, now do they, this is simply not fun. 
Perhaps you remember the story of the Emperor's New Clothes by Hans Christian Andersen. The tale relates how the king had employed an expensive and gifted tailor for the task of making his new outfit. The king's ego was enormous and he paid the tailor a vast amount of gold to make him a suit that would be the most splendid in all the land yet when the clothes were finished the king was positive that he actually had none on. The cunning tailor assured king that the clothes were in fact woven from enchanted thread that could only be seen by those possessed of great intelligence. But to the very stupid, he said, the fabric would be invisible. All the members of his court at once assured the king that the fabrics he had done were the finest ever and his new clothes were absolutely superb and magnificent, indeed the most splendid and dazzling they had ever seen. So then the king turned to them and said he was very pleased they were not all stupid and not wishing to himself appear stupid to the members of his court, he walked about the kingdom naked and had a parade to show the town his new attire. The entire town cheered and praised the emperor's new clothes and all discussed the splendor of the magnificent garments and the quality of the stitching among themselves until one young peasant boy who knew nothing of ego dared to ask, Why is the king naked? And it was true. The king was in fact no more than a naked fool surrounded by bigger fools who had all been controlled by their own egos. Well, in a scenario almost reminiscent of a scene from Anderson's story, there is now enough real evidence to totally disprove the history we have been asked to believe, much of it is right out in plain view and yet it is still being ignored and in some cases flatly denied by mainstream academia. Those people who do try to investigate these things and bring to public attention, issues that may sometimes go against the norm, are ridiculed, usually by someone with a degree who invariably uses their position of assumed knowledge as a means to completely disregard and discredit what is often quite significant research or substantial facts. No opposing evidence is ever presented by the academic quarter and the poor researcher is then usually subjected to a series of vilifying personal attacks designed to shift the tension away from the actual evidence they were trying to present in the first place. If they then attempt to protest and return to the actual issue, they are generally harassed, banned from archaeological sites and made the brunt of endless bad media coverage until they finally just shut up and go away. The whole issue is then closed, hushed up and forgotten as quickly as possible, hopefully to never again see the light of day. It's a sad, but unfortunately, very common occurrence these days to see an archaeologist, anthropologist or academic heavyweight who has been backed into a corner by indisputable evidence, suddenly start brandishing their degree and launch into a series of scathing personal attacks against their opposition, simply because they can come up with no valid scientific rebuttals to dispute the hard cold facts they have been presented with. Unfortunately when so many debates surrounding these issues are continuously and repeatedly conducted in such a predictable and completely unscientific manner, after a while it becomes difficult to think imaginatively enough to see it as anything else but a conspiracy. In all reality, any reasonable theories need to be fully evaluated. All the world-leading archaeological teams need to combine their resources, all the available information needs to be accessed and viewed together as a whole. All of the monuments need to be examined and messy and all the existing ancient texts from all countries need to be studied together as one, though due to the world's population's constant religious and racial bickering such a thing may never actually occur. Many of these ancient tales have always been viewed exclusively as myth and fantasy. But when these ancient myths are corroborated by each other and by physical evidence and when such inexplicable evidence is in turn found to be adequately explained by the myths then it stands to logic and reason that perhaps a more detailed scrutiny may perhaps be in order. Could some of these ancient texts and scriptures actually contain complex scientific information, hidden within the narrative in the form of code or new morology as Newton and many others have believed? Is there a coming Armageddon? Are we to expect a devastating global war? Could a global catastrophe, a celestial event or polar reversal such as is alluded to so often be what we are being warned of in ancient texts and myths? Is that what the monuments and astronomical alignments are trying to tell us? Do they tell us to watch for certain astronomical or celestial signs that warn of impending disaster? There have been many authors who have theorized that it is indeed so. In fact, it has recently been discovered that there is a computer code or algorithm running through the entire Hebrew Bible that has been now confirmed to be real by many of the world's leading mathematicians. 
the author who released his study of the code believes it tells us of a coming world war. The code appears to speak of or predict all major world events past, present and future and simply has no right being there unless someone put it there purposely, and that someone must either have been a time traveler who knew of all the events that would ever befall the world, or lived for literally thousands of years, or possibly even something else, some intelligence vastly more significant. Does this mean that God is real? Could it be that time is cyclic as some have surmised? It says in the Bible that the end days will be as the first days, and implies as much in many other texts and legends. But have both have these periods already come gone before? Is man destined to repeat again, things that have befallen in the past? It is the intention of this work to explore many of these questions in an effort to provide a deeper understanding of our past, our future, ourselves and the perilous situation we now find ourselves in. The journey towards our future begins with an understanding of our past and so I would first now like to present to you, a collect of rather intriguing artifacts, just so you can first see what kind of parts actually have been found around our planet that might suggest to us, that perhaps a wider investigation of our true past may be sorely needed by the powers that be. There is a myriad of these rather unusual discoveries that have been made, some recently some many years ago and all of these artifacts represent discoveries that need to be included as pieces of the puzzle if we are ever to gain any coherent picture of our past so hold on folks because when you really start looking into some of these intriguing discoveries and begin to grasp a true understanding of their real significance and where they all may actually come from the conclusions can be quite astounding